First of all, this has been an amazing, amazing weekend. I can't believe the cool people that we've got to hang out with. And there's a little bit more left. I'm so excited. Ah, ah, it's so good. Um, guys, we're going to talk about some visual effects. And uh, we're going to talk about using Fusion. And here's what's cool. How many people are like, visual effects and Fusion, that doesn't sound like something I can do. That sounds... I'm very intimidated right now. <laughs> Here's what's going to be cool. At the end of this, you can, either, you can either follow along during this if you have the files, or if you don't, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that you'll be able to make something really cool in Fusion at the end of this. All right? Ah, this is, no this is so cool. There's no toast, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but, but <laughs> either there's toast or we riot. I'm here for the food. All right. <laughs> I don't know what that voice was. <laughs> That's General Heckler, I guess. <laughs> like, get off the stage. <laughs> I don't know. Um, here's something we're going to be making. It's pretty, it's pretty dang exciting, huh? Pretty dang exciting. So. It's not perfect, but I think it's pretty cool, and um, and this is this is how it's made. This is how it's made. Okay, check this out. Whoops. Oh boy. All right. So here's some of the uh, the nodes that we're going to be using today. And who looks at that and goes, no thanks. <laughs> like that's way too many little squigglies, and no thank you forever. Goodbye. Um, here's the good news. We're going to walk through each of these, and uh, you're going to understand it or else. <laughs> so um, even if you've never done any compositing in Fusion, uh, I, I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm just now kind of starting to get into the visual effects stuff. Uh, I've been really um, practicing a lot. I've, been, I've comped this shot probably 80 times in the last couple weeks. Um, and I, I'm really excited to share some cool tips, cool little things, cool uh, concepts that I've been learning about visual effects in general and especially about compositing in, uh, in Fusion. And I think there's going to be light bulbs for some of us who are a little bit into it. And uh, if you're new to it, um, I, think, I think things are going to start to make sense here, okay? So let's start out, let's go to the edit page, all right? And I'm going to start with a, a shot. This is just our uh, background plate. So this is just a, um, a shot that we shot out at the, the beach just about an hour that way. And um, the idea has always been to put some kind of spaceship in uh, on, on this part here. And we shot it in Blackmagic RAW. And now this is, uh, this is Blackmagic Film Gen 5. And so it's all gray and washed out. And we have these light stands here to help with the tracking because we do have a moving shot here. OK? So we got a little bit of uh, an idea of what we're going to be doing here. Let's grab this and bring it into the edit page under the timeline. And with our playhead over that clip, we're just going to go ahead and click Infusion. OK. So we talked a little bit yesterday about how uh, nodes are just a flowchart, right? And right now we have a really basic flowchart. We have media in and media out. Media in takes a piece of media from the uh, edit page, brings it into Fusion. Media out sends it back. Everything fancy happens in between. Now. Uh, to make some visual effects, what we're going to have to do is, uh, one, I, I kind of look at it as solving problems, right? It's creative, but it's also like, if you think about what you want to make and then compare it with what's there right now, chances are, I mean, you can. it might sound like a negative way to, to say it, but I look like, well, there's a few problems here. If this shot is supposed to look like it, <laughs> it's supposed to look like this shot, um, what's wrong with it? Tell me from the from the audience here. What's what does this need? Spaceship. Needs a spaceship, right? That's going to be pretty. That's going to be a very big factor in having a spaceship. Uh, almost essential, I would say. <laughs> okay, so we need a spaceship. Uh, what else? Yeah, it's washed out, right? The colors are kind of washed out, uh, so that that isn't great. Um, hmm. Okay, so we got to put the spaceship over it. We got to deal with the colors. What else might be wrong with this? Tatooine, the sky is gray. Yeah, well, well, this isn't Tatooine. This is this is a non-specific, <laughs> non-Star Wars planet. All right, we don't want to get sued. All right, this is Bad Tatooine. It's it's way worse. 
<laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, somebody said something, though. Uh, what's wrong with this? It needs more contrast. Needs more contrast. Yeah, that's part of it. What else? Light stands. You, I mean, the guy didn't park his spaceship on top of light stands, right? So we're going to have to deal with some of that. OK, that's probably enough to get started. We'll probably figure out some other, other jobs we need uh, to, to go first. OK, so here's the first really cool thing in Fusion. If you type Shift Spacebar, it brings up this Select Tool Palette, OK? This is really cool. In fact, you don't even need this toolbar if you don't want. You can save a little bit of screen space and get rid of it if you want to. Uh, you can go. Um, you can go up to, is it Fusion? Yeah, Fusion, Show Toolbar, and uncheck that. We don't need that. That's fine. We're going to just search, Shift Spacebar, just like that. And now uh, I'm going to type in Note, N-O-T-E, and that'll make a sticky note. And so this is a great place, if I double click on it, to give us a little to-do list. So we need to add a ship. Cool, no problem. We need to deal with the colors. Hmm. We need to get rid of the light stands. Okay, let's just start with that. That's probably plenty for, you know, compositing this live. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let, let's start with the obvious. It needs a ship, right? So where are we going to get a ship? Well, luckily, luckily, uh, we have a ship rendered out of Blender. And so if you're following along in the media pool here, uh, if you have ResolveCon VFX KC2A open, you'll have a saucer3.exr. Who knows what an EXR file is? Who, who's like familiar with that? Wow, OK. So an EXR file is a still image. And it's generally, um, you'll find that uh, 3D is rendered in EXRs a lot. EXR is a very high quality format. And you can actually combine a bunch of different layers inside of an EXR. And so you can make a 3D render, and you can have uh, you know, reflections, and you can have uh, all kinds of different, um, they're called uh, passes, that you, can, um, that you can decide to view. And it's all built into one image. It's really cool. So this EXR is a image of our saucer. And I'll just grab that and drag it in. And if I hit 2 on the keyboard, everything breaks. <laughs> I quit. <laughs> All right, I won't quit. Um, the reason why it breaks and why it's red right here is this layer here under our inspector is not selected. So if we select layer, we have all these different layers that we can view from uh, our render, which is uh, from Blender here. So um, if we select combined, here's our spaceship. Okay. Now, um, like I said, there's all kinds of different layers. If we switch to a different layer like AO, which is ambient occlusion, this is what that looks like. And there's all kinds of different things. Oh, man. You can just go crazy looking at all the different things here. Um, some of these don't show up, um, but some of them make sense. Anyway, so we have the, uh, the spaceship. We want to put it over our image. So how do we put something over something else in the Fusion page? A merge node, a merge node, right? So we'll take the output of this media in two and merge it over our media in one, just like that. And I'll select media out one and hit two on the keyboard. And uh, as Alex would say, job done. We're, we're pretty much done. So we'll just go ahead and render that. Um, it looks pretty good. <laughs> OK, it looks terrible. All right, it looks terrible. Uh, why does it look bad? Well, um, one of the reasons is the ship's really big. So that's, that's probably a problem. Um, it's also really uh, contrasty. It's a little darker, and uh, it just doesn't match with our footage. There's, there's kind of some stuff wrong with that. So let's, OK, so now that we've added a ship, um, well, well, we still need to deal with the colors. Uh, ship is too big. OK, um, needs to move over. And then um, let's see, if we play this back, then uh-oh. Well, this, uh, this image this image doesn't move along with our shot. Hmm. So we're going to have to deal with that, too. Oh, boy. Deal with camera shake. And it looks like our job is just getting, just getting worse and worse here. <laughs> But here's the, here's the great thing. We got the basics here. We got, we got the ship over the shot, so we're, like, so we're most of the way there. Um, what, should we, what should we tackle next? What do you guys think? Should we make the ship smaller, or should we deal with the colors? What do you think? Hmm. 
Okay, let's scale the ship. I'm, I'm not, it's not a trick question. I'm, I'm literally, we could probably do either one of those and it would be fine. So let's scale the ship. Okay, so first thing let's do, uh, we can scale something in a bunch of different ways in Fusion. Um, one way is you can select the merge node and you can adjust it here in the inspector of the merge node. So you can adjust the size and the angle and the center and all that stuff in the merge node. But here's a big concept to understand for Fusion. It's not really a good idea to do that. Okay, here's why. Um, there's nothing, I guess, wrong with that necessarily, especially if you're just doing something quick. But one of the advantages of nodes is that you have this map of all the things you're doing. And uh, you, the great thing about having a map is you have everything laid out and it can be really clear of every little step that you're doing. And if you have the merge doing anything other than just merging something over something else um, and you, you know, have it also adjusting the size and the center and all that stuff, then you're kind of hiding some special things that you're doing. And so if you come back to this a year later and you're like, yeah, I need to fix that shot. And you're like, why is it acting weird? Well, it's because you have stuff in the merge that isn't obvious if you just look at the node graph. Okay, so what we want to do is add a transform node. I'm going to select this media into, let's actually rename this first. Let's say F2, and we'll call this ship underscore MI for media in. And then this media in one, let's rename this F2. We'll call this background footage MI for media in. Okay, just so we know. So let's take this ship MI, I'll hit shift space bar to select a tool. And the tool we're gonna look for is transform. And I can quickly bring up a transform just by hitting XF. That brings that up, that's like the little shortcut. And I can hit enter. Now, nothing happens because we're telling it to transform, but we're not telling it to transform it in any way. It's just transform it and do nothing with it. And it's like, great, yeah, awesome, thank you. We're paying you how much, uh, transform? Okay, so now we can adjust the size and we can move this around. And it functionally works kind of the same way as the merge, but the advantage is that we see what's going on here in our map. And then we could say, all right, do we like it transformed or not? We can just turn this off and on and kind of you know, decide that later. So you're kind of setting yourself up for success later, okay? So that's pretty good. Um, maybe we'll even change the, uh, the angle of this a little bit. Yeah, there's our, there's our, um, there's our little shot, okay. Now, Let's talk about colors. This is kind of a, a big thing. Um, Y'all were paying attention during Cullen's uh, session, right? Because that's going to make this a lot easier. Um, color space transforms. That, that should sound familiar now. Um, what we want to do is use color space transforms on this uh, to basically make everything uh, have colors that roughly match. Okay. Now. The problem with this, with any kind of compositing, especially uh, if you're compositing CG, is that you're starting with a certain color space. So this background footage, this is in uh, Blackmagic Design um, uh, BMD Film uh, Gen 5, okay? And then this ship is actually rendered in ACES. And who knows what ACES is? Okay. <laughs> So uh, ACES is a color space that uh, it's, it's actually a way of color managing, but there's a, a color space that you use when you render out 3D uh, called ACES CG. And long story short, uh, it's, a lot of, um, it, it's a lot of space for colors to kind of play around in. It's really high quality, it's great, but it's different than a, than a camera, okay? So we're going to have to, in some fashion, bring both of these color spaces into the same color space. Just like we were talking about earlier, uh, Colin was talking about uh, bringing everything into DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate, right? Uh, it's sort of a similar thing. Now, since we're in Fusion, we're going to bring this into linear space. Now, linear space is... Uh, it, it's a way of treating color that mimics how like physics works in the real world, okay? So if you have a light that is twice as bright as another light, it's going to look, it, it should look twice as bright, right? And that's like how the actual physics works. But to our eyes, it doesn't necessarily look twice as bright. To a camera, especially a camera that's shooting in log, it doesn't look necessarily twice as bright. And so there's kind of this messing with all of the colors that's happening with our footage. 
Uh, and we need to basically bring everything into reality mode and into uh, linear space so that we can put things together. And if something's twice as bright, that it, the, the actual values are twice as bright. Okay? If you're a little lost here, it's okay. Just do what I do for now. Okay? So, background footage. The first thing we're going to do is add a color space transform. I'm going to move this over a little bit. I'll hit shift spacebar and type color. And I'll go down to color space transform and hit enter. And this is the same thing that we see in the color page. Uh, for our input color space, we're going to use Blackmagic Wide Gamut Gen 4.5. That's what it was shot in. Input gamma is Blackmagic Design Film Gen 5. Output color space, we're actually going to use uh, the same thing for this one. We're going to go with Blackmagic Wide Gamut Gen 4.5 and the output gamma, we're going to go linear. Okay. So all that's doing is it's taking all of the colors, like all of the different kinds of colors that could be there, and it's not doing a whole lot to them, but it's it's adjusting the uh, it's adjusting the brightnesses to kind of make sense um, when we composite. Now this ship, this we have to do kind of a similar thing. So I'll take this color space transform and I'll hit Control C. So I'm copying this node. Switch over to the ship and hit Control V, and now it's going to ruin it. It's just going to just just destroy it. That's just because we don't have our input color space set right. Okay, for our input color space, we're going to go Aces AP1 and linear. All right. Again, if you don't know what all that means, it's okay. I'm also going to take off our tone mapping. Turn that to none. Same thing over here. We'll take our tone mapping onto none. Okay. Now, what that's going to do is bring these both into linear, which effectively is going to look real bad. Okay, So if, if it looks bad, chances are you might have done it right. Okay, <laughs> This is not true most of the time, uh, but it's like we were talking about earlier. This is the raw chicken. Okay, Don't eat this. We're going to do some stuff to it. I'm going to take another color space transform. Uh, just hit Control C, and then after this merge, hit Control V. All right, We're setting up our color, our color management here. This color space transform, we're going to start where we actually were here, which is black magic wide gamut gen 4.5 and linear, like this. And let's go with wide gamut gen 4.5 linear. And we're going to turn this back, crazy sauce, into black magic design film gen 5. So look at that. That's interesting. What we've effectively done is nothing to our background image. But we've taken our foreground image, this ship, and we've transformed it to match better with the background image. Okay, You can do this a bunch of different ways. We could put them both in uh, DaVinci Wide Gamut. We could do a bunch of stuff. But this is a simple-ish way to do it that would work fine for this, this um, tutorial here. Okay, Now, we still have a problem of it's gray and washed out. So congratulations, we've done nothing. It's awesome. <laughs> but here's what we're going to do. We're going to preview what this would look like with a rough color grade on it so that we can do our compositing and everything and kind of pretend like it's already color graded. But we're going to do that in a non-destructive way where we don't have to um, composite everything after it's color graded. Okay? So we're basically looking at it through a fancy lens uh, just in Fusion so that when we bring this into the color page, things don't break. All right. The way that we do that is up here in the upper right hand corner, this little lattice thing here. This is our LUT. And I'm just going to go down to Blackmagic Design. And we're going to go to Blackmagic Design Gen 5 Film to Video. And that won't be perfect, but it'll give us a pretty good approximation of what this will look like with some color management on it, you know, with, with a grade on it. Okay. So now this is already looking better. It's already looking a lot better. Um, and honestly, we haven't done anything creative. It's like Cullen was saying earlier, uh, it, we haven't made any major creative decisions. All we've done is just treat our colors properly, right? So that's cool. All right, so we've, we've, we're actually doing pretty good here. Our ship was too big. Well, now it's, gone. Now it's not too big anymore. We even moved it over. Uh, OK, I split those in two just to make it seem like we did more. It was kind of one thing, but it's fine. It's fine. OK, we dealt with some colors. That's pretty good. Um, but now uh, we have a couple more problems here. Um, one is the light stands. So why don't, we, why don't we go ahead and deal with that? But actually, before we even deal with that, we're going to need to deal with the camera shake. 
So again, this camera is kind of moving back and forth, and the ship isn't, which um, if we had a news story about that and we were interviewing somebody looking at it, uh, that would be classified as a dead giveaway. All right? That's a dead giveaway. So what we want to do is grab the motion that is happening in our clip, and we're going to take that and we're going to move everything else the exact same way. All right? That's called a match move. We're matching the movement. The way that we do that is with a planar tracker. You can do it a bunch of different ways, um, but a planar tracker I, I really like. So I'm going to take between our color space transform and our merge right here. Again, shift space bar. We can search for anything in the world. The world is our burrito. Let's type P-L-A-N, and that's going to bring up planar tracker, or Petra, as I like to call it. So get our Petra and hit add. And now, this brings us into tracking mode. I'm going to hit 2 on the keyboard just to bring this up. And look at this. Oh, baby, what's happening here? Uh, this is actually giving us a linear signal, and then it is being transformed by our LUT. That's why it looks crazy sauce. Um, we can just turn off our LUT for now, and it will look a little bit slightly more reasonable. Um, but anyway, we can grab our tracker, and we can click anywhere on our uh, background here, and we can draw a shape. And generally what you want to do with the planar tracker, what it does is it selects a group of points. All right, You're basically selecting an area on your image to put a bunch of trackers, and then it kind of averages out the movement of those trackers. The planar tracker infusion isn't really like a planar tracker like uh, Mocha. It's basically just a way to group uh, a ton of um, points and kind of uh, get the motion from them all at once without having to set one tracker here and one tracker here. It's, it's a lazy way to do it that works great, and that's why I love it, okay? So I'm selecting the area of the image that I know has two things. One, it's close to what I want to put in because I want that, that ship to be sort of near there. And two, it has high contrast because by default, what it's going to look like, look for is a difference between a light pixel and a dark pixel, and it's going to latch onto that. And then it, any movement that happens, it's going to try and put that, that tracker there the entire time. It's going to do that a few dozen times around here, maybe more than that. Um, and it's going to give us a tracking result. Before we get crazy, before we get crazy and, and start tracking, we're going to go over to the inspector, and I want to set a couple things. First of all, I want to set our render time, or our reference time. I'll hit set. And for me, it's 58. It doesn't matter what it is for you. I, I was so irresponsible. I didn't think about this at all. I just started randomly in the middle of this shot. Fortunately, it's okay. Um, we just need to make sure, okay, 58, that's great. Um, tracker, we can leave as point. Motion track or motion type we have as perspective. So what this does is it figures out the type of motion that it's trying to make from this. Uh, perspective is like if you're tracking my hand and my hand does this, right? That's like perspective. So one side is moving differently. It's kind of moving around in 3D space. That's something you'd want to track if your camera was moving a whole lot, right? Um, and by moving, I mean like translating in space, like moving back and forth. Um, but there's a whole list of these things. And generally, at the top of a list like this, that's the simplest. And the bottom is the most crazy. So what we really want to do, just to save time and resources, and it's just less problems, is we want to pick the one closest to the top that we can, OK? Translation is moving like this. Translation and rotation is moving like this and rotating. Translation, rotation, and scale is doing that and also getting bigger and smaller. All right. So what of these are happening? Well, it's moving back and forth. And it's probably rotating a little bit because I happen to know we shot this just holding a camera like this. Probably is going to be a little bit of rotation. So I'll do that. I don't think it's scaling because we're not moving the, the camera back and forth or anything. So let's just go translation and rotation. And everything else should be good. And let's go ahead and hit this far right button here. This is track to end. OK, watch what it, do, what it does. So that's going to grab a bunch of points, and it's going to track them. So now we've tracked like the last half of our shot. To go back to this point so we can track this way, a quick way is just to go to go. That's going to bring it back to reference time, which is 58. And then let's track backwards. So we're tracking that backwards. And now we've tracked this entire shot, tracked the movement just like that. To see if we've done a good job, 
a great thing to do is here under operation mode where it says track, just switch this to steady. And now what I like to do is zoom in and put this like on the corner of the screen so that we can see really easily how much it's moving around and then play this back and see how much it moves. And we're zoomed in at 400% and it's not moving too much. It looks pretty good for what we're doing. If it was moving around and tweaking and kind of doing a bunch of weird stuff uh, more than just what is, you know, uh, native just because of the resolution and stuff. If it was doing it more than this, we'd have a problem. But this is going to be a pretty good track, okay? So we're just using this, this uh, steady thing to check and make sure our track is good. So as long as things aren't moving around, that means we have a good track. I'll switch this back from operation mode steady to track. And now we're going to do something magical. This button right here, create planar transform. We're going to click that and Here's what's going to happen. Once we click that, it's going to make a new node. And that node is going to be like a holder for all of the movement that we just tracked. Okay? So I'll click that, and it's going to put it wherever it wants. It might put it in Narnia. I don't know. Um, but you, go, you know, scroll through when you finally find it. And uh, this is going to be our best friend. All right? In fact, I'm going to rename our best friend. I'll select it and hit F2. And we'll type track underscore PXF. PXF is short for planar transform. XF is transform, right? Track PXF, great. And now planar tracker, you've done your job. Thank you. I appreciate you, but go away. I'm going to go ahead and delete that. We don't need the tracker anymore because all of the data is in that tracker, track PXF, okay? Now, we're going to do something that will almost work. Are you ready for this? It's going to be so almost great. <laughs> You're going to be like, wow. Man, this is, this is almost worth it. <laughs> so I'm going to switch to media out and hit 2 on the keyboard to bring up our shot. I'm going to switch back and turn on our LUT so we can see what's going on. And now this part of our tree right here is our ship. So this is our ship and our color space transform and our transform. I'm going to move our transform up. And right before our merge, that's where I'm going to put this track planar, tra trainer, planar transform. I'm going to hold shift. and if you hold shift while you're grabbing something, you can drop it right there on a connection. Okay, so this is in between. By the way, my arrows go like this because I've right clicked and went to options and I've chosen orthogonal pipes. Okay, you can also choose direct. Um, I started liking orthogonal because it's nice and nice and tidy. Okay, so now this is almost gonna work, it's gonna be great. So as we play this back, it's going to sort of move with our camera. <laughs> Isn't that great? I know nothing about VFX. This is my very, I did a terrible job tracking. Goodbye. No, um, there's actually nothing wrong here because remember we checked our track. Everything was cool. We checked with everybody. We, we, we wrote letters and they wrote back and they said, I'm sorry, sir. It, it is, everything is great. And, and then so I respond and I say, what gives? What gives? Why is this? Look at this. This is still in dead giveaway territory. Like it sort of moves along with it, but look, it's like, it's like moving around. It's weird. Well, the reason for that is because when you apply tracking data and it really when you transform stuff inside of Fusion, this is a huge, a huge concept. You have to have a matching size for your foreground and your background. Okay. Now this is a problem. This is a problem because your foreground and your background aren't going to have the same size stuff all the time. Like, what am I going to do? Like, perfectly design everything to be exactly where I want it? That's why we have post-production, man. Like, we're going to move stuff around. We're going to resize stuff. So, like, what, what gives? Well, what we really need to do is just put this, uh, this flying saucer on a background that's the same size. There's a bunch of different ways to do that. One way that I've been doing that lately is using an effect called crop. Okay, so here uh, between our color space transform and transform, I'll select color space transform and hit shift spacebar and type C R O P. And this is crazy. This is very technical. All right, but if I hit enter, it moves up. We'll deal with that in a minute. But this track will work. Now the track works. And it's solid. It's great. That's because 
what the crop actually does is kind of a weird, it, it's like a weird uh, thing to call it because it doesn't necessarily crop something. It puts it into a different size. And so what's actually happening here is we've gone from this, well, let me actually, there we go. We've gone from something that looks like this, this is our image, to this. And we've just cropped the top of it which makes it the same size as our background. And now our tracker and our transform and everything, they go, yeah, everything makes sense and I'm happy. Now, uh, this could be a problem depending on what size of um, image we have. But for this kind of thing, um, we, uh, like you can move this around and everything. We could offset this and like use the Y offset and move this back in the center if it's cutting it off or whatever. It doesn't really matter. Um, what's important is the resolution here, okay? So now, if we go back to 2, um, this is moved around, but we can still grab our transform and we can move this around and it's going to stick wherever we leave it. We can resize it, we can do all this stuff, and it's going to be totally fine because of the, uh, of, of the order of the things that we've done here. Okay. So remember, order is important. This is a flowchart. First we have our ship, then we adjust the colors on it which you can't really see on this, but then we crop it, then we transform it, then we apply the uh, tracking data, and then we put it over our image, and then we do our color space transform so that it actually looks decent, okay? So we've done a lot of things here. We've dealt with our camera shake, and now we have to get rid of our light stands. So uh, how many people have used image editing software and uh, like cloned something out before? Okay, lots of us. This should make total sense. This is going to be the easy part, all right? We do have to do something a little bit tricky before we get to the easy part, but don't worry, it's going to be okay. So click anywhere outside of our nodes, like probably up here. I'll just click there for a second and hit shift space bar. And we're going to type time, T-I-M-E. And what I'm looking for is time speed or to speed. Okay, I'll hit enter. That's going to make a time speed node. This is a really, really useful node. What this does is it remaps time, okay? And you can do this for uh, time, like uh, all kinds of speed ramping and everything. But most of the time, what I use it for is a still frame, okay? Let's go ahead and just pick any random frame. Um, I think we were at frame 58 earlier, so track, uh, yeah, reference 58. Let's just keep it. Let's keep it classy. Let's let's keep it at 58. Doesn't matter. We're going to um, we're going to pause this image right here. Let me just turn off my saucer so we can look at this. We're going to pause this image right here so that we can clone out these light stands without having to um, clone it out every frame because it's moving around, right? So we're basically going to take a still photo and we're going to clone it out and then we're going to track that little piece of the still photo over this as kind of a patch and that's that's how we're going to paint out our light stands so the first thing we need to do is make this into a still we're going to start at frame 58 so with this time speed i'll go over to the inspector and speed we're going to say zero delay we're going to say 58. all right that's all we have to do and now if we play this back um actually i need to Actually, I need to uh, actually hook this up. So under after color space transform, let's take the output of this color space transform and put it into time speed. And if I hit uh, two on the keyboard, it's kind of, uh, we have to deal with the colors. But as you can see, our guy's not moving and our uh, camera's not shaking. It's just a still, okay? If we have a still, we're doing great. Now we can take that still and we can clone it out just like we would in a photo editing app, right? So I'll take this and we're gonna add another node, shift spacebar, and I'm gonna type paint, P-I-A-P-A-I-N-T, or just type P-N-T, and I can't type, there we go, and I'll hit add. So now we gotta rearrange our nodes a little bit. This is, this is to be expected, okay? And we'll go from the top down. And this paint node, that's what we're going to use to do our clone. Uh, it's not real obvious how to set up a clone with a paint node, okay? But here's how you do it. You select the paint node, you go over to the inspector, and this second little icon here with two brushes is clone mode, 
All right? Just click on that. So now you're in clone mode. And it almost looks like you could do stuff here. But you can't. You have to go over here to the fourth icon where it's just a single, but, a single brush stroke, um, not the one that looks like the clone. <laughs> hmm. This one, the stroke one. You would not believe how many times I get these backwards. And I'm just like, why isn't it working? There is a massive bug. Write a report. I'm like, no, I just forgot. <laughs> and so here's what we're going to do. We're going to zoom in. And I'm going to uh, hold my click and drag with my middle mouse button here to move around in the canvas, close my media pool because I need some room. And I can hit Alt to pick whatever part I want to clone from. And then I can kind of line this up right here and I can paint my thing. I don't have this set, something's weird. And I always forget what it is. I don't have my paint loaded, there we go. Okay, make sure that you're actually viewing the uh, <laughs> the, the node you're working on. I'm going to reset that, make sure I'm still in the right mode. Okay. There we go. Casey, what's your time speed going into? Time speed is going right into paint. Yep. So it's coming from it's coming from color space transform. You could also take it from background footage. Is that true? No, that's not true. Connecting the color space transform. It's, ta it's coming directly from color space transform oh. into, co into time speed. Oh. So color space transform splitting it, right? It's going right into time speed, oh. and then we're going into paint, OK? I'm popping up a merge node for some reason. <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't, the, you shouldn't need a merge node. OK, so we're going to do that, and then we're going to start. Ooh, something's wrong. What is it? This has happened before. Do, 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 do. There it is. There it is. Yep, it just keeps giving, doesn't it? OK. <laughs> so great. You wouldn't believe how many times I've done exactly that. All right. If you want to adjust the size of this, you can hold down Control and drag like that. All right. So we'll do that. Hold down Alt. And is it? Thank you, God. OK, it's actually going. <laughs> All right. So we're going to do kind of the same thing. I'm going to do a really great job this time um, because I'm doing this live. But you get the idea. You take a lot of time and you paint this out. And you do, you do a much better job than I'm about to do. Okay. And that's kind of how you get rid of something. And we'll just kind of keep trucking here. Okay. Now, um, you would want to put in those clouds. You would want to take more time. But you, you, guys, you guys have all cloned things before. It works the same way. All right. So now we've basically gotten rid of our light stands. Now, uh, this is going to work perfectly because we're still on a still. And um, yeah, it, it's absolutely fine, except for nothing's moving and we don't see anything that we want. <laughs> so what we're going to do is merge this over everything, uh, merge this over our background image, actually, before we merge our ship over it. So we'll take the output of this and merge it over our color space transform like this. And so what we're doing is we're splitting our color space transform. That's going into time speed, and it's getting merged over itself. But we only want it to do that right where that, uh, those light stands were. We don't want it over the whole thing because we want our guy to walk, right? So we're going to use a mask. A mask, remember, only it, it tells a node to only do whatever the node is doing just right here, just inside of this, this circle, OK? So let's say uh, shift spacebar and I'll type, um, let's do polygon. So P-O-L, we'll bring up polygon, and I'll hit add. That'll add a polygon mask to our merge. And I'll just bring this down below. And what we're doing, what we're saying is, OK, when you merge this over, only do it inside of this mask. So I'll select polygon, and I'll just kind of draw a little box here. And I'll hit 2 on the keyboard. And at frame 58, this will look beautiful. There's our stands, and we're just going to take those out like this. And we'll just kind of put this little patch over here. So here's with the patch, and here's without it. We're just getting rid of those stands. Make sense? OK. Um, we can also feather out that mask a little bit. I'll just soften that edge a little. And we'll call that good. Now, we're going to run into a problem here immediately. If we move off of frame 58, look what happens. Weirdness happens. Look at this. Oh, goodness, no. Um, 
this is weird, right? <laughs> that's not, that's not going to work out. So what we need to do is we need to use our tracking data that we already made for sticking our, uh, our ship to the shot, and we're going to put that still over the shot and move that along with the shot, and we're also going to do that with the mask. So we can take this track PXF, and I can hit Control C and click off of this and hit Control V to paste it. I'll hold down Shift and just put this in between our merge and our paint, and now this is going to move along with our, with our shot. Same thing for polygon. I'll hit Control V with the polygon. If I have something selected, it will paste it after, after whatever I have selected. So we have this tracking data being applied not only to our ship, but also to our still and to the mask that controls where our still shows up. Okay? So we're saying just do it here, and it's being tracked, and the thing that we are masking is being tracked, and the ship is being tracked on top of that. Okay, so now that will give us, if I turn our ship back on, go to our media out, turn on our LUT, now that will give us a shot without the light stands that is tracked and has our ship tracked on there. Pretty cool, right? Now, there's a, uh, yeah, we, we did it. We got rid of the light stands. This is great. Now, this is a, a, a pretty decent um, composite so far. And actually, I'm going to take a second and kind of label things. So this tree right here, this is our ship. So uh, a little cool thing that you can do in Fusion is you can select a bunch of nodes and hit Shift Spacebar and type UND. And that's going to make an underlay. Underlay. I'll hit Enter. And that makes a little panel behind it where you can label stuff, which is very nice. So uh, I'm going to click off of this, hold down Alt, and click back on it. And then I can select the underlay by itself. If I don't do that, and I just grab the underlay, it'll move everything. So I'll click off of it, hold down Alt, and click on this. So I'm just selecting the underlay. Then I can hit F2 and rename it. And we'll call this Ship, like that. And I can right click and set a color. So I don't know, we'll make it orange. OK. So now we have this kind of labeled. I'll start to spread these out a little bit just because it looks nicer when they're spread out. I used to want to keep things like together a lot, but it looks nicer when it's spread out. It looks like, you know. So I'll select all of this stuff. This is our paint out. And I'll hit Shift Spacebar, Paint, or no, Underlay, UND. Hold down Alt, select that, F2, same thing. And we'll call this Paint Out like that. And we'll make it a pretty color, like violet. OK? There's our paint out. So um, that's kind of the basic idea. But there are a couple, there are a couple things uh, that I want to clue you in on. Um, one is, I'll, I'll make, uh, keep ourselves organized here. One is there's a problem with our colors. Okay. The other one, the other one is some 3D nerdiness. Which one should we talk about first? What do you think? It's your your call. 3D nerdiness. 3D nerdiness. Okay. So, one thing that's really cool about making a 3D render is you have control over everything. You have control over the lighting. You have control over the quality. Um, you know, I this ship isn't the most realistic model in the world. I uh, modeled it really quickly, but you know, we could make all kinds of greebles and little like crazy things on this ship and add lights and everything. But what's really cool about a 3D render is you have all of those layers we were talking about earlier. So, one of the things with this shot is that the brightness of the top of this ship is just a little bit too dark. If this was out in a sunny day, I would expect the top of this ship to be a little bit brighter. Okay, So to fix that, we can do that with a, a, color, uh, a color corrector. right? And we could even put a color corrector on here and uh, mask it, and that would work. So um, uh, yeah, let's try that. So I'll take the ship here, and we'll just bring this up. And I think after our color space transform, but before our crop, we will hit shift space bar and type color. And the second one, color corrector, I'll grab that. And um, 
what we could do is we could add a mask to this and we could do something like bring up our lift, except for there's a problem with that, which is what we need to talk about. But um, we'll just do something quick here to uh, make the point. Um, we could gain this up like this and then only select the top of this ship with a mask. And that would be a way to deal with it, right? But uh, because this is a 3D render, we can actually use some of those other layers to make a mask for us, uh, which is actually called a matte, which is a black and white image uh, that controls the transparency of something. So let's grab our ship MI, and I'm going to hit Control C, double click off of this, and hit Control V, and I'm just going to make a straight up copy of this. All right, so we copied the ship, but this time, with the ship selected in the inspector, I'll go over to where it says layer. And again, there's all these different kinds of layers, which is just more than we can get into today. But one of the things, if we scroll down here, uh, there are some layers called normals. Now, a normal in 3D is basically a way to describe what direction a face is facing in 3D. And so if my hand was you know, in 3D or whatever, the normal of my hand would be straight out like this. So um, without getting super complicated, this normal Z, this is basically going to highlight uh, the, the places in the image that have a face in 3D that's facing up in the Z axis, which is actually kind of convenient because if we have this uh, ship and it's being lit from the sun, which is up above it, the, the pieces of the ship that are facing up are going to be brighter. So what we can do is grab this view layer normal Z, and I'll just bring this up in our first viewer here, and look what we have. This is a white map of everything that's facing up in the shot. If we were to view a different layer like Y, that's everything that's kind of facing um, facing other directions, X, like that, right? But normal Z, that's actually pretty useful for us, right? So we can use this to change where our color corrector happens. I can take the output of this and just push this into the mask input of our color corrector, and that will limit where our color corrector does things. But if we select the color corrector, and we go up to settings, and here where it says, uh, fit mask crop channel alpha. Let's change this channel to luminance. What this is doing is it's taking the channel of the mask, whatever you have input in the mask, and it's saying, how do you want me to use this as a mask? A lot of the time, if you have a mask, it's actually giving it an alpha channel. So wherever it's transparent, that's where you want things to be to uh, not be affected. But we're giving it a black and white image, and so we're saying anywhere where it's black, don't do stuff. Where it's white, definitely do stuff. So we've set that to luminance, and now if I select this color corrector and go up to correction and I move this around, it's only going to adjust the top of my ship and it's going to do it in a really accurate way, a lot better than if I were to roto this out, right? So that's pretty cool. So what we can do is we can do something you know, pretty simple like push this gamma up, oops, or the gain, or whatever we want. Oops, I reset this. I went to settings, and there we go. Luminance. Isn't that cool? So we can kind of adjust this and make it work a little better. So it's only adjusting the top of the, uh, the ship, and it looks a little bit more realistic for the lighting. Pretty cool. OK, so that's some 3D nerdiness. You can use, like, that's a really common thing in uh, compositing, especially if you're using 3D compositing. Um, man, you can use those layers for all kinds of crazy things. Like, it's wild. There's actual magic that happens with that stuff, okay? But uh, one thing I want to I want to kind of leave you guys with, uh, this is something that I've been, uh, honestly, this is kind of one of those things where I'm like, I've been compositing kind of off and on uh, for many years, and I never really understood this. And I'm going to try my best to uh, explain this in a way to where I would appreciate somebody explaining it to me without me having to read many books and articles and such on this uh, learning VFX. There is a problem when you have something like this, where we have a ship with transparency, right, that's on a transparent background, and you want to color correct it.
We kind of saw it a little bit earlier. I'll just take this off uh, real quick. Take this thing off. We kind of saw this earlier when I was trying to color correct it and I grabbed something like the lift. You see how it's adjusting the whole shot and not what I want, even though this is, um, even though this ship is, it only exists like in the middle, there's, there's transparency all around. That is because of a certain concept in visual effects called multiplication. Okay, so basically, uh, Ah, this is way too much to explain with Fusion. Here's what we got to do, all right? Uh, so you guys know the very hungry caterpillar, right? <laughs> <laughs> you guys know this book? You know what I'm talking about? Eric Carle? You guy's a boss, all right? <laughs> he, write, he makes the dopest books. Uh, so here's, here's his process. Here's what he does. So this guy... He paints on, um, on tissue paper, and he kind of just paints randomly, paints something that looks cool, okay? Uh, and he ends up with something like this. And then what he does is he cuts out pieces, and he puts them together in kind of like a collage art, and he makes uh, animals and, all, and kid, like, um, you know, children and all kinds of like, cool stuff out of these pieces that he's cut out. All right, and then it ends up looking awesome. Well, uh, you may have noticed um, when he paints this, look at this right here. Look, he set this down on the table and he's not being really specific about where he's painting. He's just laying it on, okay? Paint's going everywhere, all right? Everybody in his studio is like, dude, you've gone crazy. Uh, he just gets it everywhere, it's messy, right? And then when he cuts it out, look how pristine that looks. That's not messy at all. That looks awesome. And look at this, like this is beautiful. Imagine what it would be like if he cut out white paper and he made all the shapes and he put it down on the paper like this. And these were all white shapes. And then he took his drippy brush and he was like, all right, I'm gonna color it in now. How well do you think that would work out? Some people are very talented and could probably do a decent job with that, but I know if it were me, what would happen is it would be awful. It would, it would look, uh, well, it would look about like this. It would, look like, it would look like that, but a children's book, and then I'd bring it to the publisher and they'd be like, sir, please quit. Please quit making, making this art. Okay, why am I going into this? Well, here's the thing. When you have something that's transparent, uh, like this image, and you want to do some color correction on it, you kind of need to set it up the same way. Because if you're going to mess with the colors and cut it out, it's best to mess with the colors before you cut it out so you don't get the mess everywhere. Uh, so what we need to do instead of bringing in our cut out thing and then coloring it, right, is we need to bring it in and then lay it on a nice piece of paper where we can be messy and be messy all we want and then cut it out so it looks nice, all right? So uh, here's something also that I hope that this shows up live. Um, let me see if this will, this will actually work. It's sometimes hard to see this difference, but it is a real difference, and it becomes a very big problem sometimes. Um, let's, uh, oh, actually, can I do that? I'm not sure if I can do that. Um, but here's, here's basically how it works. Uh, before you color correct anything with a transparency, you need to lay it down on top of something so you don't get it messy. That is called dividing, okay? It's the opposite of multiplication. It's like math. Yeah, it's like math, okay? So you type divide, alpha divide, and what that's going to do is ruin it. It's going to just look worse, <laughs> all right? So look at the edges here. Like, dude, do you want that as your final comp? You're like, oh yeah, man, this, is, this looks... Let's see, why, is it, why does it even look that bad? I don't know. Um, what's going on? What did I do? What have I done? I did something crazy to make it look even, even worse than I thought it would. Um, let me think what's happening. I'm not sure. It's okay. Um, but anyway, you have these like awful edges here. That's because what it's doing is when something is transparent, it's actually kind of blurred at the edges. That's why it looks nice, 
uh, is because it has a little tiny blur. And what happens is when you color correct that little tiny blur, uh, things get messed up. And so what we do is we take off that blur and we make it really junky looking. Then we can do our color correction. And then after we do our color correction, so after this color corrector, you can hit shift spacebar and type multiply. That's alpha multiply and hit add. What that's going to do is cut it out nicely. So we're laying it onto, onto a table that we can be messy on, just like our hero here. And then we're cutting it out nicely. OK? So now that it's cut out nicely, we can do any kind of color correction we want to do uh, without worrying about it. Oh, it's because I was messing with the colors earlier. <laughs> I know how things work. <laughs> this is my first day. <laughs> And so um, let's put this back into here, but actually the right way. Let's put it into the blue input. And we'll select luminance. And we'll adjust our colors. And we can push up our gain to match however we want to do, right? And now we have these really nice edges that make a whole lot of sense. And I'm really banking that this actually looks different, but we'll <laughs> do this. If I hold down Control and select Alpha divide and alpha multiply and hit control P. It's not going to work, is it? Well, believe me, it is sometimes a very, very, very big deal. Um, it will mess up the edges, basically, if you don't do it this way. And so basically, what you're doing here is in between divide and multiply, you're making a safe zone. So I'll type underlay, and we'll call this safe zone. All right. In this safe zone, that's where you can actually um, color correct stuff without ruining everything. All right, So that's where we want to put any kind of color correction on something that has transparency like that. Now, that is a concept I didn't know about at all. And so um, when you are compositing something that has some transparency, like a stock footage, that, like stock footage that you might get of like a uh, you know, gunshots, explosions, anything like that, and you want to color correct them and make them brighter. Um, if you've ever tried that in Fusion, chances are you put that on there, tried to make it brighter, and then it ruins everything. And it's all because of this stinking thing right here. It's all because of divide and multiply. So if you don't know, if, some, if your colors are acting weird, you have to put it down on the table, do all your colors, and then cut it out nicely. So that is the problem with colors. And now we're we're doing we're doing pretty good on this on this whole thing. Um, I don't know if we'll have time. I don't think we'll have time to do the shadow. But I'll tell you kind of how I did it in this other comp here. So let's switch back over. Really, um, these like few concepts that I've gone over. If you understand some of these, you have this massive toolbox to do so much stuff because a lot of the things are actually very similar. Okay, so to make a shadow. Here's all we're really doing with the shadow. Let's just zoom into the shadow. This is three notes. Oh, well, there's more notes than that. <laughs> um, this shadow tint, this is just color correction. So what we're doing is, it's hard to show you without the colors, but what we're doing is basically just darkening this image and merging it over itself with a multiply mode. So if I take this off right here, we're just basically making a darker, um, a darker copy of our background, and we're putting it over itself with a multiply transfer, which means to, it basically makes things darker, right? And then I have a uh, I have a mask, which is cutting out this little ridge here, and then we have a mask that is cutting out the shape of the saucer. And we're putting those together. We're putting those together so that the mask and the saucer, where those go together, we have this little tiny bit of land here that is darkened. Okay, this is the mask. And then that goes through our tracker so that it sticks to the image. And we have just the darker version of our image inside of that circle, which is limited to only happen on the sand right there. Okay. So it's the same thing. We're color correcting. We're putting a mask on it. We're tracking stuff. It's kind of the same thing. I also, if you noticed earlier, there was a smudge on this on this lens. We were out here. We were out on the beach, and I think a piece of sand or something got on the lens right here. 
And so you can kind of see the difference. Uh, and when this moves around, again, it's really distracting. There's kind of this little, little smudge there. And so how would you think we fix that? It's pretty much the same way that we fixed uh, the, the uh, light stands. And so we made, a, we made a still frame and painted this out and then tracked it back onto itself so that it moves along with the footage. And then we put a mask on it that's also tracked. Actually, I didn't even track the mask. I just put it right there. And then that all comes together for the finished shot. So really, now, if we zoom out here, um, I hope that this doesn't look quite as crazy because we've walked through a lot of this, right? We have our saucer, which all we're doing is taking the saucer, dividing it, doing some color correction. Part of that is with that, that normal Z, which is just the upper part of our uh, ship. And then we crop it, which we already talked about. We're making it the same size. We transform it to put it right where it's supposed to be. We apply the tracking data. And then we put it over itself. I have a couple of little extra things here. But for the most part, that's pretty much what we're doing. So I hope that helps you uh, with your visual effects stuff. And I uh, hope that helps you kind of think about, man, some cool stuff can happen in the Fusion page. So, so glad to share this with you guys. Thank you so much. Well done, my friend. As usual, you continue to impress me. All right, guys. Uh, before we jump into some Q&A with Casey here, uh, we're going to get our, uh, I, I'm going to say our last online eligible giveaway of today, which is going to be giveaway number five for this big boy right here, the DaVinci Resolve quotes mini panel uh type exclamation point giveaway five in chat if you'd like to be entered into that giveaway and um at the end of our q a time we'll be drawing a winner for that and uh an additional in-house only winner for one of the uh cloud store minis which is pretty awesome so uh let's move into uh q a here where's my phone in my pocket doy all right, any questions for Casey? You're closer, so you win. <laughs> Hello. Um, I was just wondering, is there a specific reason why you put the uh, divide and multiply nodes around the color corrector instead of checking the pre-divide, post-multiply box in the color corrector node? Yeah. <laughs> The, the short story is that uh, to do, uh, to, with, with that little checkbox in the color corrector, it's um, dividing it and then multiplying it. And then if you add another corrector, it divides it and multiplies it again. And you generally don't want to do that a bunch. So if you add like three color correctors, you, you're degrading your image is the thing. So this, this keeps it higher quality. Yep. Someone else, another question? Also, you're closer. You win. Yes. Thanks again. This has been great. Favorite weekend all year. Wonderful. Um, I was curious. We have such a badass computer sitting right there, the Puget mm -hmm. Systems. Maybe at the end of this, if you just wanted to ramp like a gajillion particles through it in Fusion, <laughs> I just kind of want to see where it breaks. <laughs> that, that would be fun. We might, we might be able to do that. All right. Over here. Saw you first. Um, yeah, uh, for me, uh, just starting to get used to Fusion a little bit. Uh, the thing that trips me up a lot is all these in and out points of each node. Mm -hmm. uh, how, any any suggestions of how to start to wrap my mind about around that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, any node in Fusion, if you uh, mouse over one of these in and out points, it tells you what it is. So that's a big thing. Uh, usually the main one is yellow. It's all about the colors. So it kind of gets confusing because, you know, it can come from any direction and the directions don't matter. It's all about the colors and the shapes, right? So uh, your yellow is usually your main input. 
your blue is always your mask input, and then your square is always the output. And those can be anywhere, and it doesn't really matter. It doesn't change it. The other thing that you can do is if you are going to hook up a node to another node, you can right click and drag instead of normal click and drag. And you can drop it on a node, and you'll get a nice little, a nice little uh, menu here. And you can select what you want to connect it to, so you don't even have to remember. Just say foreground, and that's what you want to do. It really kind of comes down to getting some experience with the nodes, uh, and I mean, building something really simple, like merging one thing over something else and getting really used to the merge node. And you know, this is a lot to take in all at once, but really, like, you know, the main concepts are you have your output, and that outputs an image. And depending on what node you're hooking it up to, you might have a different reason to put it into a certain input. You know, um, a mask generally goes into the mask input, right? But up here, this isn't a mask. This is a mat. This is actually an image that we're putting into the mask input. Which, if we were to just drop this into the color corrector without being really careful, just drop it on there, it connects it to the green input. Just because by default, color corrector, the second thing you connect to it is the match reference. Okay, so you can either right click and drag over there, and select effect mask, or you can be really careful and drag this over the blue input, and connect it to the effect mask. But you kind of have to like have an idea of what you want to do before you connect it, and that'll that'll help a lot. Which again, a lot of that is just thinking about it before you do it, or you can just kind of put it together and see if it works, and then kind of fix it from there, which is often what I do. <laughs> well, thank you so much. That's been great. I'm less scared now to touch Fusion than you know, before. Um, so going back to the uh, spaceship crop example when we were trying to do like the tracking, the camera tracking uh -huh. part. So we did crop since the uh, video is 1920 by 800, and mm -hmm. uh, you know the, the, the 3D is uh, 1920 by 1080. Yeah. If it was the opposite, would you do like a, a transparent solid layer to match it, or you, you, you could, still you do a crop? Do the same thing from. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that if you put a crop on something and it's it's a smaller resolution, it will just put it on the bigger canvas. Okay. So yeah. It's, it's weird because it, it does crop, but it's not necessarily always a crop. It's more like put it on a on a canvas that's the right size. Yeah, and it can also crop. Yeah. So kind of, kind of speaking on that, um, is there a reason you're using a crop and not a resize node? Yeah, so a resize node will actually re, uh, it will resample the image. And a crop is just kind of adjusting the edges of it, right? There are certain, certain times where you could probably use either, and it wouldn't matter a whole lot. But I think generally, you try and use a crop. You can also merge it over a transparent background, which is what I've done a lot, what a lot of people do. Similar kind of um, similar result. Yeah, thanks. So it's it's rather new to see you use uh, color space transform nodes in uh, in Fusion. Mm -hmm. um, just to reiterate on the last node in your media, before your media out, uh -huh. the output color space is that supposed to be the same as the timeline working space of yeah, the rest of the your idea. project? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it basically it, it takes it into compositing mode, into linear, and you put everything together, and then you, you're kind of pretending like this is how you shot it, right? So you're bringing it back into color, into camera space. This could also, yeah, it could be uh, you know, DaVinci uh, Intermediate if you want to. It's whatever you're kind of working in. Um, because when you get to the color, uh, you want this to act basically like the other shots in your in your uh, timeline. That's the idea. So going back to the crop, I'm trying to make an analogy that makes sense to me. Would, okay. that, would that be like in like Photoshop when you add to the canvas or take yeah, away from the canvas? Yeah, it's a lot like that. Yep. that same sort of thing? Very similar. Okay. Yep. Any other questions for Casey here in-house? OK, we'll move on to one of the questions from our online audience here. Can you expose parameters for .exr files to work with Fusion like you can with, let's say, Unreal Engine? Um, can you expose parameters to work with them? What was the question? Can you expose parameters for .exr files to work within Fusion uh -huh. like you can with Unreal Engine? 
I'm not sure what they mean by work within with an Unreal Engine, but you can me either. <laughs> you can um, you can basically anything that's in an EXR you can access within Fusion, and one way to do it is just how we did it, which is in the media in. You can select the layer. You can also go to your different channels here, and you can do things like uh, this X velocity channel. You can put um, you know different passes into these different channels. And what's really cool is there are certain tools in Fusion that use certain channels. And so if you have like your uh, your velocity channel from your render, your your velocity render or level. From, uh, layer from your render, you can put that into the right channel in Fusion so that something that uses that channel in Fusion can access that in the right way. It's, it's crazy. It gets deep pretty quick. Um, but yeah, you can do that. There's also, um, if you use Reactor, which is like a um, it's a collection of scripts and plugins that kind of the community makes inside of Fusion. You can download that. Uh, there are ways to split an EXR into a bunch of different passes, and you can do really fancy compositing stuff that, um, yeah, is, is pretty far beyond the basics. So it's really cool. The sky's the limit, basically. Uh, when can you copy the track underscore PFX1? Is it linked to the original? If I change parameters on one, does it change the other? Yeah, that's a great question because it's a little confusing. So this uh, track PXF, you, it, there's not really anything to change. It's just kind of a holder for the data, right? And so all of that data is pretty much copied from the track. And so it's just it's just a, it's like a transform node that just has all the keyframes in it. That's why you have all these ticks right here. It's just a bunch of keyframes. And so you don't really adjust a whole lot. And so there's not really any big deal with just duplicating it a bunch because you're the, the idea is that you get it right before you make those planar transform nodes. Um, and if you don't have it right, you've got to fix it in the tracker before you make that planar transform. There's also ways to use the tracker kind of as the same thing, but this is like kind of a cleaner way to do it. So, yeah. OK. All right, guys. Uh, let's give it up for Casey. That was an incredible presentation.